Thanks for tuning in. It's me, Jay Baker. Today's episode is all about dividends. Each quarter, we release our dividend monitor, covering everything from payment trends to future outlooks across the FTSE 350. To coincide with the release of the latest edition, we hosted a special webcast where our panel of experts posed the question, what does recovery look like? This event is part of our AHEAD program for corporate governance professionals. The AHEAD community is free to join and open to all, regardless of what stage your career is at. So if you're not already signed up, we'll pop some details in the description about how to get involved. We're now going to replay a recording of our webcast, so I'll pass you over to my boss, Ian Stokes, Managing Director of Corporate Markets, EMEA, at Link Group, who will introduce you to our panel of guests. And before I forget, if you haven't downloaded your copy of the Quarterly Dividend Monitor, we'll leave a link in the description for that too. Good morning and a warm welcome to our third Dividend Monitor webcast and thank you very much for joining us. With the help of Orient Capital's webcast services, we're pleased to have the opportunity to discuss what industry experts think of the latest results. I'd like to start by introducing myself and our expert panel with you this morning. I'm Ian Stokes, Managing Director, Corporate Markets EMEA at Link Group. And I'm joined today by Mark Baker, Research Director at Five Eye Research UK, and James Baxter Derrington, Asset Management Correspondent at Investment Week. The pandemic made for the worst year on record for dividends last year, but happily things are on the up now. Recent figures from fund manager J.O. Hambro shows company profits bottomed out in the summer of 2020 as companies adapted their operations to trade even through severe lockdowns. The same report suggests profits are now roaring back to life and will return to their pre-pandemic level by the spring of next year. Our most recent edition of the UK Dividend Monitor shows the same happening to dividends. During today's webcast, we'll be discussing what looks like the recovery of UK dividends as we see life returning to some sense of normality. We have often cautioned that the rebound was going to look quite lumpy, so we will talk about what the second quarter figures showed us and what conclusions we can draw about the rest of this year and beyond. But before we start, James, if you don't mind, I'll turn to you. Uh, why do you think dividends matter to your readers at Investment Week? There's a huge variety of reasons that dividends do matter to, to our readers and to, you know, to any sort of investor. But at the real heart of it, as with any other form of investing, a return on that capital is really vital. And dividends at their the most basic form are an easily understood and guaranteed form of this income. You know, for those investors at the older end of the spectrum who are looking to generate a source of income from their, their retirement funds, dividends provide that, that income as a steady, predictable stream without having to eat into the capital that's been set aside initially. And for younger investors, it provides another source of capital. So if the dividends come in, they can be reinvested and that can just simply grow that the capital that's already there and allow those investments to continue to grow over the longer term. And, you know, even a, a smaller than expected dividend is still worthwhile as that's still money that can be reinvested back in. And, you know, finally, it also provides quite a healthy insight into how a company's doing and the wider market and a variety of uh, other factors need to be considered with it, but a dividend that continually grows year on year and beats the market is a, a pretty good indicator that the, the firm is is doing well, really. Thanks, James. My director uh, towards you, Mark, if you don't mind, and maybe you could just help us by setting the scene and reminding us what was happening this time last year. Well, yeah, and thanks for having me, Ian. Um, gosh, what a year it was last year, one we'd like we've never seen before, uh, even worse than, than, than the kind of aftermath of the global financial crisis. Uh, I think what was really unusual in the second quarter last year, which is really when everything started from the to point at which the pandemic began, is that the cuts came kind of preemptively. They were precautionary in many cases because companies just didn't know what this meant, what lockdowns meant, how long they were going to go on, what it meant for their businesses. So they pulled, even dividends that had been announced, they pulled. Uh, and others cut. So if we look over the course of the whole year, something like two thirds of UK companies either cut or cancel the dividend. And in that second quarter last year, dividend payouts dropped by a half. So we're kind of coming off a very favourable base right now when we look at what's happening this year. But the impact did get a bit less severe as the quarters progressed, because as you said in your introduction, you know, profits bottomed out last summer and companies adapted quite quickly. So then they were able to understand how much money they had left 
uh, to, to give out. There were also some wrinkles. So the banking sector, I think, is a really important one, which we'll probably talk about a bit more later on. But, they, you know, the PRA banned them from paying dividends full stop. And since they're responsible for about a pound in every seven pounds of dividends that get distributed, that made quite a big dent in the UK total. Um, and oil dividends were also quite important. So, you know, they, they're about, oh, gosh, about 20% of UK dividends before, before the pandemic. So cuts that came from the oil sector also made a pretty big impact. Sure. I, I guess with quarter two this year being the first to be set against a COVID-19 quarter, the comparisons were always going to be favourable. Can you give us a, an overall picture on just how we fared during the quarter? Yeah, well, it was great, actually. Um, it's really exciting to have to see it all coming back so strongly because the numbers beat our forecasts. And it is it is a difficult year, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second, how to exactly predict what's going on. But the total jumped by 51% in the second quarter. If you strip out the kind of volatile one-off special dividends, it was about 44% up. But that's still about a sixth below the pre-pandemic level. So, you know, we're not back to where we started, but we're on the way. Um, it is going to be a noisy year. Uh, that's quite important to mention. So there's a whole mix of things going on. Companies are restoring their dividends. Some of them are playing, paying kind of catch-up payments for ones that they missed last year. And some of that happened in the second half of last year too. There was also a whole lot of timetabling changes. So the second quarter last year, as I said, was terrible because companies just pulled their payouts. But actually, quite a lot of them paid in the third quarter instead, which is unusual for them. BAE Systems is a good example. Now, they've returned to their normal timetable this year. So you kind of get this weird noise happening from one course to another. But we mustn't forget that companies have also just traded well, some of them, through the crisis, and they've been able to continue paying. So I think if we look at the second quarter, overall, about nine-tenths of that 51% increase is down to companies restarting payments that had cancelled. So quite a lot of it is just the kind of getting back to normal. Um, but there was some you know, good extra. And if, if I kind of take out all the noisy bits, about a billion and a half extra got paid that we didn't expect to see. So about eight percentage points better net, net, net than we were expecting. So really good. Thanks, Mark. I remember on a previous webcast, you, you were outlining the, the worst case forecast, I guess. So what are the projections now for quarter three and for quarter four? Well, I'm delighted to say we don't have a worst case forecast anymore because uh, the figures were also developing towards the top end of our expectations. So we've abandoned that altogether and we've gone back to just, uh, just having a single point forecast, as we always have done over the last 10 years or so that, that, that the dividend monitor has been running. And that's very much where we're going now. So I should say that the, the second half of the year is going to be a little bit less exciting than the second quarter. Partly that's to do with these timing effects reversing, which is something that I just you know, talked about, the, the kind of complicated timing effects. Uh, and some of it's to do with special dividends. And of course, the base effects get a little bit more challenging as we start to reach less negative quarters uh, towards the end of the year. So the second half is is going to look strong, but but not as good as the second quarter. It still means we're going to upgrade our forecast, though, and we'll come to that later. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and something we all read about in the financial press is the value of the pound. How has that affected? Yeah, yeah so uh, the UK stock market has lots of big multinational names on there, as we know, the likes of Shell and BP and the pharmaceutical giants, the mining companies, banks like HSBC. So they kind of operate in a bit of a super league that's not terribly related to what's going on here in the UK. And that also means that for the most part, they declare their dividends in dollars. Uh, so when the pound is weak against the dollar, you get a kicker. When the pound is strong against the dollar, it holds back the kind of apparent growth rate when you look at it in sterling terms. And the pound... Uh, at the moment, is stronger than it was in the equivalent period last year. It has fallen a little bit in the last few months, but if we look at the annual comparison, the pound's stronger. So about a billion and a half less in pound terms in the second quarter than we would have got. That's more or less what we were expecting. Uh, and actually, it'll, the, the kind of negative effect will be less severe for the rest of the year than we'd originally penciled in, just because the pound has come off the boil a little bit in the last few weeks. Yeah. Makes sense. Thanks, Mark. Uh, 
Uh, and you've mentioned a couple of sectors there, but if we think more broadly about sectors and companies, um, what are the hot sectors? What should we be looking at? Oh, well, I mean, the industrials did really well. Industrials is a very mixed sector, uh, very diverse, doing all sorts of things from sort of engineering through to support services uh, and, and different kinds of industrial construction. So it's a very, very broad um, set of companies. But uh, they they had a what 92% fall in dividends last year. So there's quite a lot of growth to come back on. Uh, they did very, very well in the second quarter. Uh, if we think of who the really big payers are that make a difference, the three big sectors are the miners, the banks, and the oils. And two-thirds of the improvement that we saw in the second quarter came from those three sectors alone. Uh, so, you know, they're the big the big ones. And I think actually probably more to come for, as the year goes by. Okay, uh, thank you. And those areas that didn't fare quite so well? So leisure and travel, obviously, terrible still. They're still barely able to operate. So it's pretty unlikely we'll see dividends from them until they're able to stabilise their businesses uh, and their balance sheets because they you know, have really continued to struggle. I think general retail also uh, not so good. Interestingly, the other sectors where the growth isn't going to look very good this year are the defensive names that you would, you know, that, that are sort of always there in thick and thin. Um, if we look, we're thinking about the kind of tobacco, the pharmaceuticals, and, and just because I, I should say that that's not a bad thing, they did very well last year. They didn't see the dividends fall. Uh, so by the same token, it's pretty hard for them to see their dividends rise this year. Um, and I think oil dividends, we should also mention that they were permanently kind of reset last year. The oil companies were arguably over distributing beforehand. They've got a lot of money to spend uh, on rejigging their businesses uh, for the kind of new energy transition. Uh, and their dividends are now are not back to where they were before the pandemic. So that I think I think they're probably going to settle at about one in ten of one pound in 10 from U of UK dividends down from about one in five before. Thank you. And you've mentioned the banks a couple of times. We always talk about the banks when we think dividends um, on it. They're always an interesting sector. I, I, I saw that Barclays announced a dividend this morning. What's, what else can you tell us about the banks? Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned Barclays because that's what, what we've seen over the last year, as I mentioned earlier, is the PRA banned the banks from paying dividends. And it was going to be a several more months yet before the restrictions were lifted, but actually the, the PRA announced a few weeks ago that they were going to lift those restrictions earlier. Barclays is one of the first to come out of the blocks uh, with a nice increase. The banks are awash with capital right now. Uh, they, they really have very, very strong balance sheets. This is nothing like what happened after the global financial crisis. And they're eager to return some of that capital to shareholders. Now, valuations in the banking sector are very, very low. So actually share buybacks, which you just mentioned Barclays has announced, that's a pretty logical move uh, for them to take. So exactly what the mix is going to be between share buybacks and, and dividends, I can't tell you at this point. But Barclays, so the dividend they announced today was worth about £350 million. The share back, buyback was worth £500 million. So yeah, I think you can see broadly where things may settle we'll see lots more coming out from the other banks over the next few days so yeah that's that that will be a, a major kind of kicker to getting us back closer to something resembling normal in our in, in uk dividends thank you mark and if we move away from thinking around sectors and companies perhaps more to different indices what what were the comparisons between bigger companies and mid mid cap companies so you would normally expect smaller companies to be more impacted by an economic downturn because they don't have the financial flexibility. They, they can't tap the bond markets whenever they want. They can't necessarily always just go out and do a rights issue if their share price is really bombed out. Uh, and they don't always have the balance sheet strength in the first place. So what that means is that they need to move fast to protect their balance sheets and limit cash outflow when things go bad. And that's definitely what happened last year. So the mid-250, so see, I've got any notes here. The mid-250, two-thirds of, of, of companies in the mid-250 cut their payouts compared to about half of the top 100. And the overall payout uh, decline was much, much bigger in the 250 than it was in the top 100, uh, which are those much more you know, 
international names and also some of those bigger defensive names. But that also means that the recovery is stronger in the mid-250, and that's what we, we saw in the second quarter. So the bounce back's quite exciting. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and a question to, to both both of you, I, I think, um, around the yield and the market generally. So after a poor 2020, we're now thankfully seeing a recovery in the stock market. Uh, how do you feel that share prices and forecast for dividends mean for prospective yields on equity? Well, we, we like to track, we always think about the yield in, in kind of forward-looking terms because it's if you, the share price today is the, is, is reflects you know all the news that there is out there about the, the market, about the company, including how much dividends they're going to pay. So we like to think forward. So we look at our forecast and we compare it to current share prices. Now our forecast has been steadily rising over the last few months, but share prices have recovered also. So that actually means that our yield forecast for the year is flat at three point one percent. A little bit more for the top one hundred. Um, I think we have three point six percent for the top one hundred and one point seven percent for the mid-250. But as I said before, the bounce back in the mid-250 is much, much faster. So you know, after a 156% increase in dividends in the second quarter, that has driven a, a faster uptick in, in the mid-250 yield than we've seen in the top 100. Definitely. And then I'll just sort of jump in a little bit in terms of you know receiving those dividends. I mean, it matters a lot um, to have that kind of sustainable dividend that that growth year on year and that's going to affect those those valuations of these companies as well it's one of the factors that investors and the market more generally looks at when it is valuing and and coming up with an idea of how well these companies are doing and if every single year they're managing to grow their dividends in a sustainable fashion that's that's a healthy sign and that probably leads um into to stronger equity valuations Another side of it is both as an inflation hedge and also when it comes to savings, for example. You know, you said the the yield there was roughly 3.1%. But even if we go just down to the lower side of things with the mid-250, that was 1.7%. And if you imagine going into to a bank and trying to find the very best savings account you can find, you'll be struggling to find even 1%. So to be able to have, even at that lower end of things, 1.7%, coming in off those investments that provides a hedge against inflation as as that has become a topic again recently, but also just a much more effective way of putting your money to work than leaving it in a bank um, with those savings account. And even a small amount of dividend dividend growth year on year, if it's just 10% year on year within seven years, that's double the dividend it was when you had your money in there to start with. So it's just quite an effective and not safe, none of it's ever safe, but a safer method of putting your money to work there. Thank you, James. We've touched on this to, to some extent already, but if we think through to the, to the end of the calendar year, uh, what do we think the outlook is for overall 2021? Well, it, it's, it's improving all the time, which is, which is great. Uh, although, I, as, I, as I mentioned, or at least it, it implied, the, the kind of best of the recovery is behind us because we had compared to the worst of the downturn last year. So overall, though, uh, even if we allow for that that kind of unwinding of those timing effects, then we think there's there's scope for a few more specials from companies with spare capital to do a bit of catch up. That might yet happen, uh, and trading is going pretty well for quite a lot of them. So that's also good. Overall, um, we think that headline dividend growth, that's including special dividends, is going to be about twenty four percent, a little bit over uh, for the full year. That includes a massive special that Tesco paid earlier in the year, however. So if you strip all of that out, we're looking at underlying dividends up about 13.5% this year to about £71 billion. You know, that's, what, £2.7 billion more than we thought three, four months ago. So pretty good, actually. Yes, I think you're right. And how do, how do we in the UK compare internationally? Okay, so we had a bad year last year compared to the rest of the world. If you look at the UK last year, we were down, or it's probably best if we think through the four pandemic quarters. So through the four pandemic quarters, UK payouts were down about 42%, 44%. Globally, it was about 14%. Um, and that's because parts of the world like North America just really didn't see any impact at all on their dividends. So similarly, Japan and parts of Asia. Um, so the UK had a much bigger decline 
uh, and uh, and therefore has much more scope for the bounce back. So the bounce back will be stronger here in the UK than it is elsewhere. Okay, well that's that's uh, that's good to hear. And this is almost uh, sounds like the sort of question might have been asked at university. But how do you do? You think the effects of the pandemic have permanently changed the dividend landscape in the UK, or or do you do you generally see the the recovery restoring itself to pre-pandemic levels? Do I, do I have a deadline for my essay? <laughs> uh, so well, I think you know, there, there's a couple of questions. So some companies have had to reset permanently. They can dividends that they pay. That's not a bad thing. I think there was some over distributing going on in the UK. The UK was always a kind of high yield market, and part of those yields reflected investor scepticism about the sustainability of some U- some UK payers. So that's fine. We do still have the concentration issue, something like 60%. Oh, I actually can't remember the numbers off the top of my head now. Or something like a third, I think, of dividends are paid by the top five, five dividend payers in the UK. That's not very healthy. You know, the irony of the, the last year is actually through... The cuts in those big payers, they will be less dominant in future than they were. And that is also a helpful thing in a way, because it means a bit more diversification. If you imagine you're owning an index fund, uh, then you know, you've got a lot of the income from that index fund coming from very really too few companies. So that's good. Uh, healthier anyway. Um, I think realistically, we're probably talking about 2025 before UK dividends get back to where they were, though because some of those big cuts just take a long time for the smaller companies to kind of grow back up to fill the space. So we we thought late 2025, six months ago, now we think it's probably going to happen sometime earlier during that year that we reached the previous high water mark. Thank you, Mark. You can have a B minus for that, I think. <laughs> and, and James, what, what, what's the investor view? What, would you, what, would your, what are your readers looking for? Um, well, I think at this point, especially a year on, and we're, we're at the first kind of point where we can properly start to imagine a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, obviously Freedom Day happened and this kind of thing. But I'd suggest this is the first dividend monitor that we've had where there is um, an end in sight and that 2025 date doesn't seem like it's plucked out of thin air anymore necessarily. It feels like there are some tangible elements that people can cling on to and, and see growing. You know, one of those is an upgrade in the forecast. It was a pretty strong forecast to start with and and it far exceeded that. Another one is the removal of that worst case scenario, which which is surely only a positive for everyone that that we've got past a stage now where we can only draw predictions within a range and we can sort of come to more of a uniform idea on it. And I think that adds a bit more confidence to the idea that that 2025 is a period where we can start to imagine those pre-COVID dividends returning. And that's a plus for the income market particularly, because we certainly saw quite a strong V-shaped recovery in equity markets. I think if you look at the S&P, the, the growth of the market has actually continued back to the pre, pre-pandemic pre level, let alone just recovering to where it was. And another sign, which I think is healthy, and I think investors are certainly holding on to is is twofold. One is that special catch-up dividend, almost. I don't think people necessarily anticipated that so many firms would be in such a good state of health, you know, not even quite out of the pandemic at all, to be able to to pay back what we thought was a year's worth of, of lost income. So that's certainly positive. And also the the realism, perhaps, to some of these dividends that are being paid, they're not jumping straight back in at that level. There, there's an understanding of there's still uncertainty in the marketplace. You know, there's a depressed rate of these dividends being paid. The earnings forecasts are depressed. And this is leaving a lot more runway for growth. And it's going to be a more sustainable growth rate going forwards. And I think at the heart of what an income investor is looking for is a bit of predictability and a bit of safety and a bit of security in those investments. So for these firms to be coming back in at a more realistic level, and leaving that runway for growth is certainly a positive for investor sentiment and one that one that people can really hold on to. Yeah, if you take that Barclays one, James, that's actually your, your point's bang on, I think, that, that they announced a 2P dividend today. The equivalent one in 2019 was 3P. So they come back in about a third below where they were, giving themselves headroom to see that grow over the next couple of years. So I'm, I think that's absolutely right. 
massively and that's just sort of on that banking one as you say they're the first dividend really to be announced out of the blocks with those restrictions fully lifted and i think um they've seen the wider marketplace and and how people have responded to the part lifting of restrictions and yeah it, it, there's no point just sort of throwing everything back out as as they as they can but as you said earlier the the banking sector certainly is quite strong it's quite flush with capital it actually sort of helped to buoy the markets this time around as opposed to 2008 obviously dragging them down so yeah it's it's that level of realism which i think is important thank you both and certainly a a positive forward view and and i think at link as we talk to our customers I think some of your sentiment echoes with the, the mood that in the conversations that we're having. If I think about how we support uh, organizations coming to the market through IPOs, we're seeing levels that we haven't seen probably for six or seven years um, as, as organizations anticipate their entry to the market. So hopefully hopefully this, uh, this enthusiasm maintains. Um, right, we're going to move to some questions from you. I can see we have, uh, we have quite a number. This is a good one. Uh, Gents, do you think the PRA would step in again if ever we were to head into a third lockdown? I'll give it a go. I feel like Mark's um, given an awful lot recently, so maybe I can jump in a little bit there. Um, I think it would be surprising to see them reinstate any kind of restrictions in that in that sort of way. I think they've been pretty cautious in the first place by putting those restrictions on and then have lifted them again in a cautious, slower process. There was part lifting. Now there's the full lifting of it. I think the banks, you know, they argued from day one that the restrictions shouldn't have to be there. They've got the capital. They know what they're doing. And I think now a large part of that initially was investor sentiment and banks shouldn't just be paying out when we're in quite a tough situation and they should be there to to support other firms rather than just simply paying shareholders. And I think that sentiment's passed a little bit. And I think the banking sector has has kind of taken its footing. It knows what it's doing with itself now. And I think the PRA would be would be loath to, as you know, anyone putting restrictions back on place. But I think the PRA would be particularly loath to to do such a thing with the third lockdown. I agree with that. I think um, you know, there's a, there was a, a sort of heavy element of moral suasion that was going on last year as well. And you know, I, I get that it was precautionary that the PRA did it in the first place. It, it was also, it, there, there was a question of how seemly it was for banks to be seen to be paying shareholders when so much bad stuff was going on. I, I think that's behind us too. And if you look at what regulators elsewhere around the world are doing, the ECB has lifted its restrictions, or they always said they were going to review them for September. They've now announced that they are lifting them. In Australia, the regulator has also lifted some of the restrictions that were going on there. In the US, they had the, the lightest of restrictions really only affected one bank, so that's not really relevant. And the only other markets where there were significant restrictions that went on, I think Sweden, Singapore, Singapore's still holding for the time being. But it's just, I think it would be very, very hard for the PRA to come back and do it. And the you know, likes of HSBC, they have a very large Chinese, uh, Hong Kong-based shareholder base. They will be furious if there was further, <laughs> further kind of restrictions on their dividends, because you know HSBC isn't really a UK bank, and yet it's, it is still, of course, regulated by the UK regulators. So I think they have to think twice before doing it again. Thank you, and Mark, you gave us a little bit of a of a global perspective a few moments ago. There's a question here around the extent to which Brexit is affecting UK shares and dividend payouts. Do you have a view on that? Well, I you know the the growth I, growth in UK dividends in the last couple of years. If you take out the special dividends and you look, well, actually, it's probably better to look at the mid caps. You look at mid cap dividend growth over the last few years, it has not been especially strong. Earnings growth has also been pretty poor from the mid caps over the last few years. This is the pandemic notwithstanding. And some of that does reflect the worst economic performance that the UK has seen in the last five years. I think separate to that is then the question of sentiment towards UK shares. And you know, valuations of the UK stock market are extremely low. Weightings by foreign investors in the UK are also quite low. So it's been quite hard to persuade people to come and, and buy UK assets over the last few years. You know, companies pay dividends from their profits. So if they can't make the profits, they can't pay the dividends. So there has certainly been an effect. I don't think the Brexit effect has been massive in UK dividends because the vast majority come from those very big companies. 
but there has been an effect in certain segments of the market. Uh, one must only hope that um, if we are able to kind of trade our way out of this, if the, if the kind of current political difficulties in the EU do get settled, that it becomes easier for these companies to operate uh, and, and, and grow and take advantage of, of the supposed opportunities. I think just sort of jumping in quickly there, Mark, what you're saying with sentiment, I think that's been one of the most important things for UK valuations, the uncertainty around Brexit and then obviously the pandemic as well. And, and people are just turned off from UK equities generally. But we've started to see a very slight acknowledgement that maybe those valuations aren't just low, they're undervalued. And maybe there is opportunity in the market. And we've certainly seen some managers opening back up to the UK space. And we've also seen retail flows heading back there as well. I think a combination of getting past that final Brexit date, I know there's you know decades left of this to actually solve, but getting past that date and there's still food on the shelves, I think helped a little bit. And I also think the vaccine rollout and that kind of giving that to the NHS, and letting them do what they do well, mm. and the government having got the, the right contracts in place for the vaccines has given a little bit more confidence that maybe we're not quite is we're not in quite a dreadful place as we thought we might be. That's that, that sort of foreign investor interest question is quite a good one. If we look at the battle that's going on over Morrison's right now, mm -hmm. um, what you're finding is that there are big, deep-pocketed foreign investors are starting to look at UK assets and think, actually, these are exceptionally cheap. And even if you adjust for the funny sector mix that we have in the UK market, to try and get everything like for like for like, you still see that valuations in the UK are, are low. So I think James is right. It's much more about sentiment and about the valuation of UK assets than it necessarily is about the dividend picture. Thank you. Uh, James, you mentioned the government there. So here's a slightly political question. In fact, it's a two part, two parts to this question. The recent G7 summit in Cornwall appeared to approve a minimum 15% corporation tax globally. So the first part is, could that have a negative impact on UK company payouts? And the second part, uh, climate change is likely to require significant investment by companies, especially in, in this ESG era. Uh, welcome your views on both of those, please. I think it's it's definitely an interesting conversation. And this minimum corporation tax is definitely a curious one. And, you know, the 15% the is a figure perhaps lower than, than people anticipated it might have been in the first place. Um, I think the idea of this being a kind of global base point for it, if anything bolsters the idea that there's going to be this sort of level playing field as such across the world. You know, we're yet to see the actual impact of it and, and the sort of technicalities behind how this might work. But I, I don't think it's necessarily going to dent uh, UK company payouts. I, I think it's possibly going to benefit them in a bit of a way um, to have that, that broader yeah, that, that kind of slightly level playing field that's supposedly the idea, but we're yet to necessarily see how it's going to work. But the ESG side of things and the climate change side of things, I think, is a very interesting point because it is one in which it does need a large amount of investment. But I do wonder if there's going to be a premium on that kind of investment. And if you're seen to be the companies that are really taking those steps, the companies that are best in class in your sector, the companies that therefore fall into the ESG index funds and into the ETFs and into all of these kind of best in class systems. I think spending that money will see a lot more money actually flowing to you. And if you can get ahead of the curve with that and capitalize on this real sentiment that we've left everything far, far too long, we really need to try and fix it now. And if you're the one fixing it and you commit to things on an ESG level, be they environmental and in benefit of climate change, be they uh, socially positive. So minimum corporate tax and, and going further and doing well and just generally good governance which is just investing in general um i think that whilst all of that requires a bit of money i think the return on that investment could well be greater than the initial outlay i think that point I, I, is really important but yes there's a lot of money to spend to adapt our economy to cope with the effects of climate change. But that actually, when you invest money, you create opportunity, you create demand, you create jobs, uh, and, and all of that ultimately drives returns. And so there'll be winners and losers, but climate change investment should create growth. It should do. 
And if you've got companies that are able to take advantage of the opportunities, they're going to make profits from that and they're going to have dividends to share with their shareholders. So I don't think this we should be too pessimistic about what that means. We should just be alive to who's going to win out of it and who's going to lose. And, and we should be ready for that as investors. Definitely. I think just to sort of add on to what you were saying there as well, um, at some point, all of these things are going to be mandated in the same way this corporation tax has come in. The environmental and climate change side of things are going to be mandated by the government at some point. 2030 is already a date for diesel and petrol. 2035 is the end of gas boilers. All of these things are starting to happen. And if you can get ahead of the curve and you can be invested in these companies when those dates come in and when further mandates on climate change come in as well, they're pretty much guaranteed to see a boost provided you've picked the the ones um, with, with good governance. And that, that comes as part of it as well. Thank you. Another one, uh, we've, we've touched on the parts of this, Mark, from a kind of global, a European and a global perspective. But were there other companies that had the, the similar hits that we have where, they're, where they've rebounded in the same sort of way? It, it, sort of mirroring Do you mean the, other countries on the parts of the world? Yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. So... It was really mixed, actually, last year. But it, you know, the UK did look bad on the wider global comparison, but it wasn't alone. Uh, and you know, if we look around our kind of similar countries around the world, that, that what we might consider our peers, France was equally badly hit as the UK, maybe even slightly worse, actually. Australia also had a really bad time, and you know, Australia's Australian dividends had a bad time. Australia itself hasn't had such a bad time over the last year. Uh, and, and, you know, in Australia, that reflected, again, a strange and rather unhealthy sector mix in their stock market. They're very dependent on enormous banks whose dividends were clamped down on by the Australian regulator. Uh, and they have some big resources companies and, and the mining companies didn't do very well last year either. They're coming back now, by the way, with a, with a vengeance uh, as commodity prices have been so strong. But payouts were, were poor last year too. And in France, it's a different story. Uh, yes, they have some big banks, but they also have those very big discretionary consumer stocks, the kind of luxury goods companies uh, and some others who were also quite badly affected uh, and uh, saw their dividends uh, fall as a result. Um, there's one other thing that's a little bit strange about the European market, which is they tend to pay just once a year. So, you know, the the big dividend hit happened in the second quarter when they were all getting ready to pay their one annual dividend. So um, that did cause a disproportionately large impact and making European picture even noisier than the UK one. But but France certainly is one of those that joined us at the bottom. <laughs> Thank you. That's comforting for those of us who uh, who, who remember the old enemy. <laughs> we were really badly hit. No chance for smugness either side of the channel. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, okay, um, I think uh, I found that absolutely uh, fascinating and some really uh, interesting questions there as well. So I might think about drawing things to a close. Uh, so before I do that, perhaps I'll jump back to you again, Mark, being as, being as you kicked off for us. So I might ask you to provide your final thoughts and, and observations on what we've seen over this last quarter. Yeah, so I, I mean, essentially, investors are... Uh, like their dividends, but the most important thing is that the dividend has to be sustainable and it should grow over time. Because if it grows over time, that's what is going to drive capital gains as well. So, you, so you know, I suppose that's how in, investors keep their capital protected against inflation. That's how they keep their income protected against inflation. So I think the reset that we saw over the last year was certainly a bit painful, but has definitely been very healthy. We've ended up with a more balanced uh, market for income now than we had before, uh, less concentration. Uh, and I think, you know, what, what it reminds us is the most important thing is to have a really good spread of investments and to be well diversified, not to be all in the UK, not to be all in one sector, think globally, focus on sustainable growing dividends, and that should do you right over the long term. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and turning to you, James, for your final Right. I think it's just sort of, um, as Mark said as well, you know, the dividends before the pandemic had got to perhaps what some would consider an unsustainable level, uh, certainly in some areas, not in all. And I think, um, you know, just as Mark said, it's a very healthy thing now. They're, they're in a healthier state of affairs. They're starting from a lower rate. There's a lot more 
room for growth and that kind of year on year sustainable growth of dividends. Um, every company has been given a bit of a get out of jail free card with it as well, because there's good reasoning for the dividends having been cut and from starting from a lower point, they don't have to necessarily explain maybe they had reached a, a ceiling with it. I think one possible point, whilst concentration has changed, 85% or so of all dividends in the UK are about 15 companies, which is it's still a very small amount of companies making up the, the vast, vast majority of it all. But I think perhaps the key thing to take away from this, whilst Q2 has been a, an extraordinary quarter, um, for dividends and, and for the numbers that we've seen and the figures that we've seen. And we're unlikely to see this kind of quarter for a little while. I think it's really worth taking heart and taking that positive sentiment moving forwards. The worst case scenario is gone. Um, this be even very strong expectations. The forecast has been revised upwards. 2025 now looks like it's more likely to happen. Um, certainly, in the earlier half of the year, when it was out towards Q3 and 4, that was a little more uncertain. But now we're looking at Q1 and 2 for 2025. I think that's certainly something heartening. And I think that's really overall what's worth taking away from this is maybe the beginning of a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that's that's worth holding on to. Thank you, James. Uh, and I agree, very, very encouraging and something I think we should all uh, think about your observation about an extraordinary quarter uh, is absolutely right in what Mark described as a very noisy year. So it's been it's been a bit of a roller coaster, I think, for all of us. At Link, we will, of course, keep watching and reporting on all of this in the future editions of our Dividend Monitor. Uh, we take a pride in providing secure and sustainable services to our clients, and, and the findings in this last Dividend Monitor clearly show the way the industry is used to operating their dividends is recovering. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning and particularly for the great questions. Uh, it would be remiss if I didn't mention the next event in the AHEAD program, which is on the 6th of October. That's the DF King and Orient Capital review of the 2021 general meeting season. And finally, uh, all that remains is for me to say thank you very much indeed to Mark and James for providing such a comprehensive uh, and humorous view, I think, uh, of, of what's happened in 2020, the first part of this year, and as we move forward throughout the rest of 2021. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, James. Very much. And yes. thank, thank you all very much indeed for listening in. Thanks for tuning in. What a great discussion and lots of encouraging signs for 2021 and beyond. If you found this podcast useful, you might want to consider hitting subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcast. That way you won't miss an episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Over and out.